Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from the International Institute for the Advancement of Sourdough Science and Research of Cleveland, Ohio, also known as My Kitchen. Thank you for selecting my video. Today's video is the first in a new series of videos called The Sourdough Apprentice. In this series, I'm inviting brand new sourdough bakers with limited or no sourdough baking experience to come here to the Institute Test Kitchen where I will teach them everything that I've learned on my sourdough journey, and they will be able to ask all the questions that beginners have when they're making sourdough bread for the first time, and then this can help you learn by hearing the questions that beginners often ask. In today's inaugural episode, I'm pleased to have my first volunteer for the Sourdough Apprentice as a very special person, my brother Bob from Burbank, California, Please welcome Brother Bob. Hi, I'm Brother Bob from Burbank, California, coming to you from the Institute of Sourdough Research and Selective Phenomenological Inquiry into the Making of um, Bread Things, also known as Tom's Brother. So Bob, tell the folks at home a little bit about your background. Hello, folks at home. Uh, I am a uh, theater professor at a college in California. I have been doing theater my entire life. Um, I started when I was uh, about 15 years old. And I have been a writer, director, playwright, and actor in theater and film for pretty much my entire life. So you've been a teacher and a filmmaker, and today I'm gonna to be teaching you and making a film about it. What could possibly go wrong? And now I know that you have a lot of experience in the kitchen. You've baked some bread before using commercial yeast, and I know that you turned me on to bread baking about five years ago. Wait, you what? Told me, you told me, I told you I wanted to bake bread, and you told me about the New York Times No Need Bread Recipe, the That's Jim right. Leahy Sullivan Street Bakery. That was the first type of bread that I ever baked is because of your recommendation. Oh, come on. It's true. Okay. But then about a year and a half ago, I got into sourdough baking and I've really been doing this now for yeah, about 16 months. And you have really not had any uh, contact with me because of the pandemic during that time. So now I'm going to teach you everything that I've learned over that period. Now, you've never made sourdough bread before. I have never made sourdough bread. But you've eaten sourdough bread? Uh, yes, I eat sourdough bread often. Okay. But you would attest, like in a court of law, that you've never made sourdough bread before because my legal department here at the Institute says that I have to prove this for the Sourdough Apprentice series. Would you like me to, would you like to hold up the book so I can swear on it? I'd the, like for the... you to sign this. I state your name to solemnly swear that I have never before made sourdough bread. Okay, now let's talk about the recipe that we'll be following. So what I'm gonna teach you is my favorite recipe. It's the Tartine Bread Basic Country Loaf. Are you familiar with this book or Tartine Bread or Chad Robertson, any of that? I can attest that I have never opened that book, nor have I even heard of it, nor this fellow that you mentioned. Okay, and there are also a lot of sourdough videos out on the internet. There's hundreds of them. I mean, I've made 40 of them, and I know that you've never watched any of my videos, but you've never watched any other sourdough videos from anybody else. I can certainly attest that I've never watched any of your hour and a half long videos about how to make sourdough bread. Okay, we'll try to keep this one under two hours, but we're off to a slow start. Okay. Okay, we're gonna follow this recipe, tartine bread, basic country loaf. Chad Robertson really popularized the artisan sourdough revival in the late 90s. He's from Northern California, he started a bakery. And if you went to California, say in the 1980s and got sourdough bread, you'd go to San Francisco, you'd go to Fisherman's Wharf, you'd have a bowl of chowder, you'd get the sourdough bread there. And that was kind of a more dense white loaf with kind of a blonde crust. 
and a very distinctive sour flavor. But what Chad Robertson was going for was more the French country style sourdough. Oh. What makes that different? It's a big, crusty, dark, crusty, thick, crusted loaf here. And the crumb is what's called an open, irregular crumb. I'm gonna hand you a photo here because that's what we want this bread to look like when it's done. <clears throat> so we don't want this to look like Wonder Bread. And it doesn't have that biting sourdough flavor of the San Francisco sourdough. It's a little bit of a milder French country style bread. Now okay. you lived in France, so did you eat sourdough when you were in France? I don't recall ever eating sourdough you in You were France. probably eating baguettes. I was eating a lot of baguettes, yes. So this is gonna to be totally new for you. Yes. Okay, so now let's talk about the difference between making traditional commercially yeasted bread versus sourdough bread, because you've made yeast, you've made bread before using these little cheater yeast packets. The reason I call these cheater packets is because they don't use the traditional process. What we're gonna learn here today is the way people made bread starting in the Fertile Crescent or in Egypt 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. We use a wild yeast starter, which I have in this jar right here. This is exactly the same way that people made bread in Egypt 3,500 years ago. The way that I created this starter is we take flour and water, we mix it together, and the yeast, which is all over the place, there's yeast on the countertop, there's yeast on your hands, there's yeast in the air, there's also yeast on the wheat. And that yeast from the wheat, from the air, from your hands, is wild yeast spores. It gets into this um, starter mix just through that contact, and then it ferments overnight, and it starts bubbling, and then you can propagate that. Some people will keep their starters going for hundreds of years. They pass them down through generations. Mine's only about a year old, but basically you don't add yeast to this. It's natural yeast from the environment. But there's also another thing in here that comes with it, and you can smell it. This is really acidic smelling, is that when you make a natural starter using <laughs> wild yeast, it also has lactic acid bacteria with it. Lactic acid bacteria symbiotically exists with wild yeast. Where you find yeast, you find lactic acid bacteria. That's what gives sourdough flavor, the sa sourdough bread, the sour flavor. Hmm. Now what happened was when people were trying to use this in bakeries, the problem is that lactic acid bacteria is that it makes this very temperature sensitive. So when you're trying to bake on a warm day versus a cold day, this behaves totally differently. It's very difficult to use wild yeast and a, and a wild sourdough starter in a factory type environment to make thousands of loaves of bread because it's inconsistent from one day to the next. So some scientists in a laboratory figured out how to strip out the yeast only from the starter. Mm -hmm. So this has no lactic acid bacteria in it, it's only the yeast. So now you don't get all the irregularities that come with lactic acid bacteria, which drives all that acidity and is very temperature sensitive. So this dramatically simplified the ability to make bread because it takes all the variability out. And also would then simplify the breads that get produced. Exactly, they all look the same, they all act the same because this is one strain <coughs> of yeast. There, there are thousands of strains of yeast in the world they took the one strongest, most consistent strain of yeast that they could find and they mass produced it. And that's what all bread makers around the world use if they're using commercial yeast. Hmm. This is like the Incredible Hulk of yeast. This is like Bruce Banner. So we still get kind of the weak, middle-aged guy. I don't know what made me think of that analogy, but the that's weak, middle-aged guy is kind of the wild yeast. Yeah. This is the super Incredible Hulk version. We're not using this. We're going back in time because what comes with the wild yeast is the flavor that the lactic acid bacteria brings. You cannot get this flavor out of a packet of yeast because the lactic acid bacteria is what brings that flavor. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the lactic acid bacteria also is working against the yeast. So that's really what we're gonna learn about today is that when we try to make bread here, there are two things in here. The yeast is trying to rise the loaf, the lactic acid bacteria is trying to, to deteriorate the loaf at the same time. Okay, I gotta just, I gotta jump in here. Yeah. Because your Hulk analogy is exact, that's what you're talking about, mm. because that, that is the nature of, of Bruce Banner, is that he is constantly at odds with his ego. There you which go. Which is the Hulk. Oh my God. And so when he changes into the Hulk, he's, he's fighting against it because he doesn't want that part of him to come out and be seen. So there's the constant battle so that's what's happening with the yeast, it's what Tom. happens with the starter, it's what happens with our bread. 
So as the yeast is trying to rise the bread, the lactic acid bacteria starts to deteriorate the bread. Yeah. So the whole skill and art of making sourdough bread is about this fermentation process where we're trying to time this perfectly to give the yeast, which is a little bit of a slow mover, the yeast has to have enough time to rise before the lactic acid bacteria, which outnumbers the yeast, before that starts to deteriorate the loaf. That's exactly what we're gonna go through today, and that's called bulk fermentation. And I'm gonna teach you how to find that perfect cutoff point at the end of bulk fermentation. That's really the art of sourdough baking, is that point where the yeast has risen the dough before the lactic acid bacteria starts to deteriorate the dough. This is epic. It's fascinating. It's story structure. <laughs> it is. It's the hero's journey, Tom. It's a battle. Every day of baking is the hero's journey. It's and the you're battle. And it's getting, it's, you're, you're trying to get to that, that perfect climax. Exactly. Where the, these two forces come together and they meet and that, you know, you, you've, you've basically, uh, from the outset, you know that these two forces had to meet at the end. And in that meeting, then that climax is what's going to produce this, um, this kind of uh, overwhelming emotional uh, release from the audience. And the interesting thing is that they not only meet at the end, they can't exist without each other. That, exactly right. Yeah. You think of, of Darth Vader and, and Luke Skywalker. Exactly. In a jar. In there a jar. There there, right there. This is, this is the new Star Wars movie right here. What? Hold on, because i got to jump in here. Yeah. All right? Because now I'm making all these connections. I, uh, I, I'm a theater professor. And theater originated, the earliest recorded uh, instance of theater is, you know, 10,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. In Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, however, um, the, the, the earliest that we know that theater was part of culture uh, regularly was ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what the so, poetics do is they lay out like this kind of like scientific, uh, mechanical process for how a story is told. Well, like if you stick to the, to the basic recipe of a well-told story, there's a chance that you will create something that moves an audience. And that's the goal of all art. There we are. Yeah. So, so today we're going to let that story play out. We are. I'm okay. going to narrate it. You're going to act it out. The thing I forgot to tell you is that from this point forward, you're doing everything. Oh. I'm not touching anything today. I'm going to hand you ingredients. You're going to do everything here. Yes. So I'm going to narrate. You're going to act it out. You are my puppeteer. Let's do it. Okay. Okay, now we're ready to make some bread. So we're going to be following the Tartine Bread Basic Country Loaf recipe, as I mentioned. I have everything written down here on a cheat sheet that I've created front and back. This has all the steps, all the ingredients, the recipe, and we can also document the times, the temperatures, and take other notes and important annotations as we go. I'll give you a copy of this that you can take when you go so you can make this at home. Yeah, thank you. Here are the ingredients if you would like to pause and review this in more detail. Now when we make sourdough bread, everything is measured in grams using the metric system. So people in the U.S. have to adapt to this because you can't measure things in cups because cups is a volume-based measure, not a weight-based measure. Mm. So if you filled a cup with different types of flour, or even if you compress the flour down in a cup, you can change the weight of that by 20 or 30 percent. So you have to really weigh these ingredients precisely because what we're doing with sourdough bread is this is considered a high hydration bread. Where we're really putting as much water in it as the flour can handle. That's what gives you that really open crumb that we're looking for. And it's a little bit like when you're mixing a bag of concrete where you put the water and you put the water and you put the water and you get to that one splash of water that's past the saturation point and it turns to soup. The exact same thing can happen with the flour. Hmm. So if you're not measuring your flour accurately or you're not measuring your water accurately, you could add 10 grams, 20 grams of water, which is a couple of tablespoons, and that can oversaturate the, the, the flour and you, you get a soupy mix. So we have to measure everything accurately. Hmm. It's all math, people. We'll try to keep the math to a minimum from here. Well, I'll do the best I can. Okay. Okay, at this point, people are saying, when are these guys actually gonna make the bread? We're getting close, not quite there yet. Okay, the first step in the process is we need to make 11. Now I did this last night. You saw what I did here. 
was I took my starter and we took 10 grams of starter and we added 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water to create what's called the leaven. And you asked a good question, what's the difference between a leaven and a starter? There are three differences. One is you need to create a leaven sometimes just to bulk up your starter to bake a loaf. This recipe calls for 200 grams. I only keep about 100 grams of my starter. So part of creating a leaven is just creating an offshoot of your starter for the, for the recipe. The second reason that you create a leaven is that because sometimes people will make a starter out of rye flour or something like that. But if I'm making a loaf that's not a rye loaf, I don't want all that rye flour in my loaf. So I just take a tiny amount of my starter and then I would mix it with the type of flour that I'm using in the recipe. So you wanna match up your flour in the leaven with the flour from your recipe. And the third reason you create a leaven, because what we're doing here is you want to de-acidify your starter. This starter, because it sits on my countertop in the middle of summer, it gets pretty acidic. If you smell that, you can smell that smells like vinegar. That, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's strong. That acidity is what starts to deteriorate the gluten in the loaf. That's the result of the lactic acid bacteria. We don't want to have all that acidity in the loaf. So you create this starter the night before the leaven with a very small amount of this acidic starter. And then that, that big bulk up of 10 times flour, 10 times water, and it creates a lower acidity starter. So when we mix this up, we're trying to keep that lactic acid bacteria at bay as long as we can to give the yeast a chance to do its job before the lactic acid bacteria starts to break down the loaf. Bruce Banner has got to control his anger. <laughs> you he's got, got to exactly. keep it at bay. So he's taking some meds at night to really try to keep things cool. Yes. And then we're going to start the process here. Okay. Now, last night when we created the leaven, it's important to know what the overnight temperature is because we had an unseasonably cool night here in the summer in Cleveland. The countertop temperature here was 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. So we were able to leave this on a countertop for 12 hours and it didn't get past its prime. When I say past its prime, you can see how the top of that is bubbled up and it's kind of domed up on top. I see that. That means that it's still rising. Okay. So you want to catch the leaven when it's still rising if it had been really warm here last night, 80 degrees in the kitchen, 27 degrees Celsius, that would have overperked and it would look flat and liquidy like that starter. Mm. That's the difference. This starter went for 24 hours. You can see the difference there. Yeah. It's like liquid. That's 12 hours. So that's still on the rise. This is past its rise. We don't want to put this in our bread because that'll start to break down the loaf. I just popped some bubbles. That's okay. Be careful. Speaking of the bubbles, this is a test that's in the book that Chad Robertson recommends to see if your leaven is ready. It's called the float test. So the float test, you're going to take a spoonful of that leaven out of there, carefully scoop it out. Try not to break too many bubbles when you do it. Kind of a little more than a half a spoonful of that, a little good. more, a little, yeah, good. And then use your finger to, to uh, push that into that cup of water. I haven't washed my hands in six weeks. Oh no. Is it floating? It's floating. It is. So we passed the float test. So this is a little bit of a controversial test because if you had stirred up that Ooh. starter, kind of like you just did, <laughs> you can degas it and then it would sink. Or if, you, if I had mixed a very watery version of that, it might sink. But if you follow the exact recipe in the book, yeah. which I always do, the float test is a good indicator. That means our leaven is fully aerated and it's good to go to aerate the loaf. So the next step is to combine leaven and the water. So we're gonna take 700 of our 750 grams of water for the recipe. We're gonna reserve 50 grams to add later with the salt. So you need 700 grams of water. You're gonna mix it with the leaven, but this is where we need to focus on the temperature because we want our dough temperature, according to this book, to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the optimal dough temperature for this bulk fermentation to work the way that Chad Robertson designed it, where the, the yeast is working at a certain level, the lactic acid bacteria is working at a certain level. If your dough gets too warm, the lactic acid bacteria will run away and your dough will turn into that liquidy starter. If, you're, if your temperature is too low, you can still make a decent loaf, but it might take 14 or 16 hours for the fermentation process to complete. We don't have all day. You know, we got a life to lead here. We're trying to get this done in four or five hours, maybe. So 80 degrees is the recommended dough temperature. That's 27 degrees Celsius that Chad Robertson recommends. To get the dough temperature to 80 degrees, we have to 
adjust our water temperature. Because right now, let's take the temperature of our ingredients. You got three ingredients to, to work with here. What's the temperature of the flour? Take the temperature of that. Okay. That's a cool 72 degrees, Tom. That's 22 degrees Celsius, so 72, 22. Now take the temperature of the leaven. That's 71 degrees. 71 degrees. Now we need to add the water to get the temperature of all the ingredients up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. So how do you figure out how to get your water temperature, the right temperature to bring everything up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit? There are some calculators out there on the internet called desired dough temperature calculators, but they grossly oversimplify this calculation. So I've devised a different calculator to do this that will give us a little bit more accurate calculation. I have this hooked up to, you know, I have the original version of the ENIAC computer in my basement. That was the first computer developed by IBM. I bought it at a garage sale in Fishkill, New oh, York. Okay. So I put these in. What was our temperature up there? It was 72, 72 degrees. I punch in 72 for the flour. Yep. Then we punch in 71 for the starter. Oh, look at that. Okay. And then we want our desired dough temperature to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 80 degrees so is what I call it. 80. Yes. Then this will give me a printout. <laughs> Of our desired dough temperature, our water temperature should be 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Let me so see that. Tom, the temperature that you want here is 86 degrees That's for correct. the water temperature. Yes, That's correct. according to the Kelvinometer yes. Bitcoin 3000. Yes, exactly. Yes. Here are the details of that water temperature calculation. You can learn more about this method in the video, bulk fermentation, mastering temperature and time. So we need to heat up this water in the microwave to 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 30 degrees Celsius. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. I got a question. Yes. Okay. Why don't you just go to the store and buy a loaf of bread? <laughs> <laughs> you can answer that question about 24 hours from now. <laughs>so we heated up our water to 86 degrees. Now we're going to combine all these together and hopefully this will bring the dough temperature all when it's combined down to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where we want to be. So we need 200 grams of leaven in that bowl. So take this leaven. There should be about 200 grams in there, maybe slightly over. That looks really good. Like I always look at what that leaven looks like when it's coming out. It's stringy. It's stringy, which is good. It's not liquidy. If it were really liquefied, <coughs> that means it's gone too far. If it were really stiff, that means it's not ready yet. That, that leaven looks really super and it smells really good. Like you can smell the it yeast does. in there and that's good because we want the yeast to get a head start here. So now we need, need to add 700 grams of 86 degree water. So press that on button again, it'll reset to zero. On. And then you wanna pour, there's more than 700 in here, so watch it as you go. Okay, exactly. 700. 700. I'm pouring, Yep. Pour. that's what I'm doing right now. Yep, pour the water. Oh, on oh! the money, on the money. Very nice, good job. Thank you. Let's throw that up with a whisk. Now we're breaking up the leaven in that water because the yeast can't swim. So we want to spread it out as much as possible. We don't want any clumps in there. No clumps. Keep going. Yeah. Okay, now I just want to pause here for a minute and just reflect on what we have here. The yeast makes the bread. I thought I was making the bread. You're not doing anything. I'm back. <clears throat> now we want to add the flour. Now I pre-measured the flour and I pre-blended that from the three flours that we talked about before because I know you, that you know how to measure flour so I don't think we need to show that. No. So what you want to do now is pour about half of the flour into the water. What in the Sam Hill is this? That's called a Danish dough whisk. Now we're not making Danish dough, we're making bread dough. <laughs> <laughs> but it's called a, it's a special dough whisk from Denmark, that special shape. It's been around for centuries. Wow. And yeah, I mean, imagine if you tried to use that whisk, that thing would get so gummed up. Yeah. You'd, you know, this thing is pretty amazing because it keeps the dough from sticking to it and it does a nice job of pre-mixing. So pour in about half of that flour. Oh my God. Okay. Like so. 
Yep, you got it. Yeah, about half. Eh. Eh. Yeah, right there. Now gently just stir that in and let it absorb into the water. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so it doesn't stick to it. Yeah, because I, I use a fork. Oh yeah, that's crazy. Or my hands. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Really? Yeah, I mean, you can. Some people like to get their hands in the dough. Yeah. This dough is so sticky because it's so wet. Yeah. That a lot of people, you know, try to use tools like that because you, you lose so much dough on your hands when you mix it by hand. Right. Now, this is the only point in the process that's kind of messy. Now I try to keep kind of a clean kitchen here. When you pour that flour in, this is the only time that the flour can fly out of the bowl. It can get on your shirt. It can get all over my kitchen. So pour this in carefully. Don't go crazy <clears throat> and just try to keep the flour in the bowl. Can I do a bit where I spill the flour all over my black sweater? I thought about that, but no, that'd be too obvious. Okay. Okay, good. It would be really funny. It would. You're not done yet. Okay, now stir that in. I'm folding, Tom. Yeah, I see that. That's a good technique. How am I doing? You're doing pretty good. Now, I know a word here, a term, it's looking a little shaggy. Shaggy ball. That's exactly right. That's from the New York Times recipe. It says mix it till it's a shaggy ball. Yep. Same thing here. Chad Robertson calls it the same thing. See, this so. is where I would put my hands in this thing. Yeah. Yeah, don't do it yet. Okay. Scrape off that Danish whisk. We're going to retire that. Aww. Yeah. You know, it has one purpose. Oh, yeah. it did a good job. It did, yeah. You know, there might be something rotten in Denmark, but it's not their whisks. Oh, oh. that was That's good. Humor. Yes. Yeah. And I thought you that got that was the right country. Yes. Yeah. There might be something rotten in Denmark, but it's not this whisk. That's good. That's from Hamlet. To be or okay. I'll hand it over. I, I, I can see you really want to put your hands in there. I do. Okay, go for it. And, you know, oh, I forgot to tell you, I have a yeast infection on my entire body. <laughs> Is that a problem? <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> Just half. You gotta mix that more. You gotta mix that oh, more aggressively. Well, I was, okay. Should I be a little aggressive with it? Yeah, you can be aggressive with that. You can't really over mix it at this point. We're <clears throat> early in the process. You gotta make sure there's no lumps of flour in there. Should I, like, if I, should I be? You're just trying to combine the ingredients. You want no dry flour. It's all we want. It's so sticky. Is there dry flour still in there anywhere? I don't see any. Okay, we're gonna call it. Okay. All right, then no. use the scraper to scrape your hands off as best you can. The so hands of Orlock. Does Chad Robertson talk about this? How to clean your hands? No. Yeah. No. Well, come on. Yeah. It's it's not. It doesn't cover a hundred percent. That's why I'm here. Okay, now it's very important, and I'm just gonna do this because you have your hands full here, is we wanna take the temperature because we were trying to get to 80 degrees. Yeah. Where are we? 82. 82, that's good because we still have another mixing step to come after this and it's gonna drop the temperature a little more. We're gonna hold this at 82 degrees and now we do something called fermentalise where we're gonna keep this at 80 degrees, 82 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. And this is basically going to let the yeast, lactic acid bacteria, the water, the water is going to hydrate the flour. The yeast is going to get a little bit of a head start here on the fermentation. And we're just going to give it 30 minutes to rest. And then we're going to come back and add the salt. Okay. So I'm going to set a 30 minute timer. Now, if we just left this on the countertop, that temperature is going to come down to our countertop temperature, which you can see there is 70 degree, 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. That's too cool. That's We need it to stay at 80. It's got to stay at 80. So when you were sleeping before you came over here, I turned the light on in the oven and I used that as my proofing chamber. And I yes. know I've told you about this before. You turn the light bulb on, the heat off, and that'll heat up my oven to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius. It's a nice warm place to keep this. I'm going to put it in there while you wash your hands. Awesome. Okay, our shaggy ball rested for 30 minutes in the proofing chamber. The temperature in the oven was exactly 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. Always take the dough temperature at every step. Let's see where we are here. 81. 81. So we went in at 82. It's coming down to 81. It should end at 80 at the end of this step. So we're, we're homing in on that 80 degree target, 27 degrees Celsius, exactly where we want to be. 
So what happened in the last 30 minutes? As soon as the leaven touched the flour, the fermentation process started. So what we're really doing now is we're controlling the fermentation process over the next three, four, five hours. And the second thing that we're doing is we're building gluten. When the water touches the flour, there's a chemical reaction that creates gluten. Uh, well, Tom, I come here from Los Angeles, California, where gluten is actually against the law. So now what do we do? Uh, that is a challenge. One of the advantages of sourdough is that through this fermentation process, where the yeast and lactic acid bacteria are eating starches and sugars, they start to break down some of the gluten in the, the dough. So people who are gluten intolerant find sourdough to be somewhat better mm -hmm. than traditionally yeasted bread, uh, but it is not gluten-free. There's nothing we can do about that at this point. All right, well, thank you, good night. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, the next step in the process is to add the salt. This is the last ingredient. So the salt just adds flavor. It actually slows down the fermentation a little bit and it helps build some gluten strength, but pretty much we're adding salt just to add flavor. There's 20 grams of salt in here, which I pre-measured. So take that salt and pour it in. Otherwise we're making Tuscan bread. That's right, exactly. People ask, can you make bread without salt? Absolutely. You can, you, you bet. It's really not enjoyable, I know. but you can make it. Yes. Okay, so just sprinkle that evenly over the top of our shaggy ball. Yeah, ta ta ta, yeah, ta ta ta. That's the first I've seen snow in the ages. Yes. Yeah, ta -ta -ta, ya -da. Okay, so that's 20 grams of salt, 2% of the flour weight as recommended. Now grab that scale. We're gonna put that bowl on the scale. We need to add 50 grams of water. So this is really the top off of our water to get up to 750 in total. 50 grams is not much, and just kind of do it around. You're gonna to try to uh, get it uh, to cover as much of that salt, but it's, 50 is not a lot. Okay. Oh, no! overshot it a little bit. No! 58, nothing you can do about that. Okay, so we're making a little higher hydration loaf, but that's not bad. 58 is acceptable. Now, I haven't seen rain in so long. <laughs> now take that off the scale, and now we have to fold in the salt until that becomes what the book calls a cohesive ball. Yeah. So the way that you do this, you get to do it with your hands, no tools required here. What you wanna do is called the pincer method where imagine if you're a lobster and you just got like pincers like this, you wanna use one hand and just grab the corner of that dough and fold it onto itself. Okay. And this is gonna go on for about three minutes. You can feel how stiff that dough is now, yeah. that's the gluten. Feel that? It's wow. Like, that's the, just the chemical reaction of mixing flour and water creates gluten. That's good. We want as much gluten as possible. Yes. And that's <laughs> off to a good start. We do want as much gluten as possible. Unless you live in Los Angeles. It's true. Now that's not a cohesive ball. See how it's kind of breaking apart in your hands? Yeah. Is that because I put too much water nope, in? Nope. No, we're fine. What you want to do now though, now that you got the salt mixed in, now do this method where you just like squeeze, yeah, just like really work so it a little bit. Kind of binding yep. what's not binding right now. Yep. Forcing it. Yep. Now go back to your pinching and folding. Method. Pinch and fold. Yep. I pinch and fold. Yep. I pinch and fold. <clears throat> now you're gonna keep doing that until that comes into a cohesive ball. It doesn't look like a cohesive ball yet, but it, it will oh, keep geez. going, keep going. God, it's not cohesing. Keep going. <laughs> Cohe cohering. Oh, wow. It's not cohering. Yes. But you say cohesive, yes, not that's, coherive. That's interesting, yes. Yeah. It's not cohesing. It's not cohesing. Is that a word? I don't know, I think it might be. Okay, now it is though. See those big flaps coming up on the side? Keep going, keep going. Okay. I started to see some cohesion. Coherent. <laughs> this is all incoherent. And this was, was this not also like the first form of a paste using wheat? Paper mache. Oh, wow. If you ever made paper mache in school, yeah. it was uh, water and flour is yes. the way that it was originally made. We used to add glue to it sometimes when we were children. But if you, you know, made the original paper mache in France, it was flour and water. Yes. It's because, papier mache, by the way. Oh, papier, yes. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, because the first three letters of gluten spell glue. 
Come on. There you go. You learn something new every day. Oh, love it. Oh, come on. Yes. What is the origin of the word? It's the uh, it's the Greek word for glue, I believe. Maybe Latin. Oh, my God. I know it was more. It seemed like it was smoother before. Yeah, now it's starting okay, to so, get shaggy. So now pause. Oh. Because anytime the the dough starts to break down your hands, this is why it's important to get your hands on the dough at this point. Just let it rest for a minute because now you can start to break the gluten strands. This is where you can actually start to overwork the dough a little bit. Yeah. But just give it a little time. Let's, gonna, we're gonna, let's give this two or three minutes. Okay. Should I perform Reiki on it? No. Okay, we waited about three minutes. I think we should transfer that into the glass bowl just so we can see better on the camera what's happening. So, okay, and now continue your process. See if you can get that into a cohesive ball. We are gonna pinch and fold. Stick and move. Stick and move. That's more cohesive. It is. You just give it a little rest that lets the gluten reconstitute itself. It's like putting it in timeout. That's it's gotta, right. You know, think about what it's done. Did you think about what you did? Are you remorseful? I think that's pretty good. Okay. We did about six minutes. That's not quite as cohesive of a ball as I've seen in the past, but I think we're okay. But I do want to take the temperature because if our supercomputer worked, this should be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And, ooh, 79. 79. 79. So we're one degree short. That's 26.1 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna get this back into the proofing chamber, which is 80 degrees. And we're gonna keep this right at 80. This goes for another 30 minute rest now. So now we've mixed all the ingredients. There's nothing more to mix. So now the next step is in bulk fermentation, we have to time this exactly to catch it at that point we talked about earlier, where the yeast is at that maximum point, but before the lactic acid bacteria starts to de decline and decompose the loaf. Yes. So how do you do that? How do you know when bulk fermentation is done? Well, Tom, the way you do that is I have no idea. Well, let me tell you, it's a good thing you're here at the Institute Woo! because one of the tools that we developed here, this is unique, you'll only see this here, this is called the Incredible bulk -o -matic Tool. I'll put this up on the screen. Now, if you had watched any of the videos that I've created, I have eight videos that talk about how to use this tool, but it's basically a nine criteria test that we can do by looking at the dough, touching the dough, smelling the dough. And what you want is in these nine categories, they're gonna go across this continuum and you want as many of those nine in that green box in the middle. That's kind of the Goldilocks zone. Wow. Not too hot, not too cold, not too long, not too short. And okay. if we can get as many of those indicators in the middle, that's how you know when bulk fermentation is done. This is one of the most difficult things for beginners to learn is when do you cut off your dough? And when you ask really experienced bakers how they do this, they develop the skill after baking hundreds of loaves. You're almost intuitively touching it, smelling it, and you can't even really tell when people are doing it. They're almost doing it instinctively. Mm -hmm. But what I really did was broke this down into all the known variables so that we could write them down. You can teach a beginner how to do it. And then you can basically learn on your first day of making sourdough bread, very much what people learn through intuition after making a hundred loaves. Yeah. So we're going to go through this test. I won't explain all the details now. We'll actually do the test as we get a little bit further into bulk fermentation. We'll go through the nine criteria. And then we'll do that a few times. And as we get towards the end, we want to get all those nine criteria in the middle. Middle. Then we're going to shape up the dough, put it in the refrigerator, do an overnight cold retard, which helps the dough ferment and develop more flavor. And then we'll bake them up in the morning. Okay. I just have one quick question. Sure. Why don't we just go to the store and buy a loaf of bread? Oh, you're still asking that question. You're going to find out tomorrow. When you taste this bread tomorrow, you're okay. going to know the answer to that question. It's the only way to know. It's been 60 minutes since we initially mixed the dough. So we're one hour into the fermentation process. Now we're gonna start a process called stretch and fold. Stretch and fold. So this is something that was popularized in the Tartine book by Chad Robertson. And this is basically a way to build the gluten matrix during the bulk fermentation process. So the yeast is basically filling up the dough with air. The gluten is created through the chemical process of water and flour combining together. But what now we need to do is basically stretch the dough and fold it over 
turn the bowl 90 degrees, stretch and fold, and we're basically laying the dough like this in a matrix. So we're building height and we're creating all these little cells that the yeast is then gonna fill with carbon dioxide. Okay. That's how you get the tall loaf and that's how you get the aerated loaf. That's how you get the matrix. Exactly, we're building the matrix. Okay, take the bonnet off of that bowl. First, let's take the temperature as we always do. We wanna be at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Where are we? We are at 79. 79, that's 26 degrees Celsius. We'll pick up a degree when we put it back into the proofing chamber. We're really close. Okay. Okay, so now stretching and folding, what you wanna do is wet your hand, take your right hand, put it in that water, wet your hand, and you wanna reach down to the bottom of the dough and lift it up as high as you can until you feel like you're, you're almost gonna tear the dough and then fold it over, turn the bowl 90 degrees, repeat it again, do that four times. Okay. Basically that's one rotation of a stretch and fold. Stretch and fold. Good. Turn 90 degrees, stretch and good. That dough looks beautiful. That looks nice, it's silky. Yep, stretch, fold, really nice looking I'm dough. Building the matrix. You are built, look at the height of that dough. That's that, beautiful. That is gorgeous. That's look at beautiful. that. beautiful, good job. Okay, stop. Okay. Now put the cover back on that. That's gonna go back into the proofing chamber for 30 minutes. We're gonna do these stretch and folds five times, roughly with 30 minute breaks. That was number one. Okay. We did stretch and fold two and three off camera, nothing significant to report there. We're just about to do stretch and fold number four, but before we do that, I think we should go through our bulk matic criteria and see where we are because this dough is moving along a bit. So I'll go through all nine of these and explain to you how to do them. First, take the lid off that and let's take the temperature. Very nice. Thank you. Temperature check. Temperature check. Temperature check. 80 degrees. Right on the money. It's right where we want to be, right in the middle of the range. Okay, now our time is two and a half hours. So the range that we're looking for is three and a half to four and a half. That's what the book recommends at that specific temperature. So the time is always related to the temperature. The percent rise we can't measure in that bowl because right. it's a flared out, irregular shaped bowl. We have to move it into this vessel. We started at 1500 milliliters when we mixed the dough. We're looking for a 30% rise. I'd say let's go to around 2000. That would be 33% rise. After we do the stretch and fold, we'll get it in there and see what our percent rise is. So we're gonna come back to that. Is the dough domed on top? Now, when I look at that, it is. See this bulge over here? Yeah. You can see there's air pushing up through the bottom of the dough. So that's definitely starting to dome on top. I'm gonna to call that low. Are there bubbles on top? I see one bubble. Yeah, I see there's one. There's one there. Yeah, there's a few. I call that a few bubbles on top. We're Coming. looking for a lot. Are there bubbles on the sides? So when you hold that bowl up and look in the side. I see a bubble. Yeah, very few though. Very few bubbles on the side. That's a little surprising. Normally I would expect to see more on the side. So uh -oh. that's, there's a few. And then the wobble test. Now this is something that people do kind of instinctively. They experience bakers when they take it out of the oven, they're walking over here. They're gonna shake the bowl a little bit. Now not too much, because you can actually okay. degas de it by shaking yeah. it too much. So just give that a little shake. Oh, that's moving nicely. See how that's starting to liquefy? It, it looks like it's really aer aerated and liquidy. Looks like jello. But there's still a shoulder around the edge. See that shoulder yeah. around the edge? When it's really fully um, proofed, you'll almost see the dough splashing against the edge. So okay. we're getting really close on that. I'd call that loose and aerated. And now, I have a question before we can. Sure, yes, yeah. Does it matter when you do the bulk in the stretch and folds. No, you can do it any time. You could, we could have done it when we added the salt. Okay. You, you can just choose to do it whenever you want to do it. And it just gives you a checkpoint of how far along the dough is at that point in time. Gotcha. Yes. Now we're going to do a window pane. The way you do a window pane, you're going to dip both your hands in that water. You're going to pull up a little bit of the dough and you're going to try to stretch a really thin translucent skin and see if you can see daylight through it. Okay. So just grab the top, not too much, no, no, not that much. Yep, and now try to stretch that 
Use your fingers to stretch it so you can see. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful window pane. My wow, look God. at that. That's incredible. Hold it down so you can see it on the upper camera. We'll just put I want to keep looking. Turn your, put your hands forward. That's okay. a nice window pane. Okay, thank you. It's still a little thick. I've seen thinner window panes than that, but that's looking really good. It's strong. And then the last test is the smell test. Now the continuum here is that under fermented dough will smell like flour and water. Mm -hmm. Over fermented dough will smell like your starter. So take a whiff of this. Wow, vinegar. Oh, that's not good, right? So we want what we're looking for is something in between where it changes from that flour smell to a ripe sweet smell. So okay. give give it a good whiff. Like so I'm really. Gonna just Get bury down, my get face down in, in there. Just don't, don't touch it and no. don't breathe on it. But oh, like, yeah. get, and, you know, get get down in there. Really get a good whiff and tell me what you smell there. That smells like flour to me. Really, let me smell it. I agree. That's still pretty flowery smelling. Good okay. job. Thank okay. you. Okay. I mean, it's the first time you've ever done this, so it hasn't turned the corner yet to the sweet smell. So if we look at our chart, I'll put this up on the screen and show you where these indicators are. We're just starting to get into the desired range here. Almost all of our indicators are kind of on the left side of the range. That implies we still have a little bit longer to go before this is done with bulk fermentation. Let's do stretch and fold number four, get this back into the proofing chamber for another 30 minutes. And then right. now you really wanna feel, this dough should feel really different now. And you wanna, but hold on. <laughs> On the last two stretch and folds, you don't want to do that big stretch. You want to be real gentle here because all we're trying to do now is build layers. We're not trying to stretch it as much. This is a little more about the fold. Very nice. Thank you. Light stretch. We want height. You're like you're you're in a dough stacking contest. I am. Yep. You feel how supple that is? Yeah. Totally different. Silky. It is silky. That's a good term cool, for it. Bubble. Yep. That's a good sign. Beautiful, good job. Okay. See how that's standing up in the bowl, really cohesive, really yeah. nice looking dough. Beauty. Okay, now, well, we have to measure our percent rise the next time around. So what I want you to do is carefully wet your hands, pick that dough up and try to flip it over mm. so we get the flat side on the top mm -hmm. and lay it down as gently as possibly into our measuring vessel. Okay. Both hands in yep. the water. Yep. Lift the whole thing up. I'm scared. Just like a little baby. I'm scared. Lift Here, it baby. Up. Here, little baby. Oh, God. Yep. Good. Carefully put it in there. Carefully. Oh, beautiful job. Nice transfer now. Maybe just push that down a little bit, but not too much. Yeah, just, yeah. We'll get that to settle down in there. Maybe you should give it a little shake a little bit. Oh, okay. Not that much. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna get this back in the proofing chamber. I mean, it's gotta settle down flat, but look at the measurement on here. If it started at 1500 milliliters, yeah. it's definitely risen. It Since has then, risen. We just gotta let it go a little bit longer. We know we have time based on the indicators. Let's put it back in the oven. We'll come back in 30 minutes. We'll decide if we do another stretch and fold or not. Okay, great. It's been three hours since we mixed the dough. We finished stretch and fold number four a half hour ago. This is where we make the decision, do we do a fifth stretch and fold? Yes. The book recommends four. You have the option to do five. The reason you would do more stretch and folds is if you, you didn't get a good window pane. Mm -hmm. Because the stretch and folds really build the gluten structure. But because we got that good window pane on the last test that we did, I think it's in good shape. And sometimes when you handle the dough late in the process, you can actually degas the dough. Right. So I think we're good, and I would not recommend the fifth stretch and fold. Now, let's take the lid off of that and see where we are, because the nature of that dough, that looks different. Wow, how would you describe that? Tom and viewers, I would describe that as a fluffy mound of whipped cream. Absolutely, it looks like marshmallow fluff. Or like uh, uh, gelato. Gelato, yes, very nice. Yeah, so enough with those kind of abstract terms. Let's do the nine tests. Take the temperature. 79. 79. Oh, 80. Okay, I'm good. We've maintained perfect temperature, which yes. is great. Time, we're at three hours. That's still to the left of the range. Recommended is three and a half to four and a half. I tend to go towards four and a half in my mm -hmm. experience. Percent rise, now we can look at it. On, it was started at 1,500 milliliters. It's... And imagine if it were 
settled flat in that bowl, you have to kind of approximate the difference in the highs I'm and lows. I'm gonna say that's 1750. 1750, so what's that, a 20% rise, roughly 22% rise. That's actually a 17% rise. We're looking for a minimum of 30. Is it domed on top? Uh, not quite. Right, it kind of actually flattened down a little bit because it was really irregular. So let yeah. me call that kind of a low dome. Okay. Are there bubbles on top? I'm not seeing bubbles. No, and that's sometimes when you transfer, it'll, it'll happen. Are there bubbles on the side? Now look at this change. Oh yeah. Boom, look at that. Oh my God. Yeah, hold that up to the camera so they can see the bubbles. On look the at side that, people. There. Yeah, that's, I'd say that's a lot of bubbles. Wobble test, not too much, not just Wobble, shake. Wobble, that's oh, good. look at that, look at that. Separating from the side a little yeah. bit. Is that splashing? No, it's still got the shoulder on the edges. I'd say it's about the same as last time. I'd say that's, that's loose and aerated. Okay. Window pane. Okay, now, this is where things get tricky. Now... Everything up to this point has been kind of fun and games, but what's happening now- Has it? It has for me at least. This is the epic battle at this point. The yeast is trying to pump out its last gasp. The yeast is running out of gas here. The lactic acid bacteria outnumbers the yeast and the lactic acid bacteria is pumping out acid. The acid releases the uninvited party guest, the protease enzyme. The protease enzyme is like a suitcase full of termites that the lactic acid bacteria brings to your party. They set it in your living room. And when the acidity level gets to a certain point in the dough, the top pops open and the termites go all over and they eat your house. So when it, we can't tell, there's no way to measure when that happens. Right. But the thing that we can tell is when the protease enzyme shows up, it starts to deteriorate the gluten. Mm. The way that we test the gluten is the window pane. Right. So the window pane is always our fail safe test to see if we're getting gluten deterioration or if we let it go. Dip the hands in the water, pull a window pane, tell me what you think. Oh, see that you're getting a little tearing there, but that's still a good window pane. Little tearing on the edges. That's still strong. Okay, so I'm, I'm not seeing evidence of a gluten deterioration there. You'll get that tearing on the edges because we used whole wheat flour in there. Mm -hmm. And remember I told you the bran, the exterior shell yeah. of the whole wheat is in there. That bran is like little samurai swords. Right. And when you stretch the dough, it's, it's cutting through the gluten strands. That's why it'll tear on the edges like that. But the center of that still looks pretty good. I think we gotta wait. The percent rise just isn't there. The last test is the smell test. What do you think of the smell? That smell has changed. Really? Let me smell it. It smells a little yeastier than the last time. It does. It does. Yes. yes. I wouldn't. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Good nose. Thanks. I wouldn't call that sweet or ripe yet though. No. But it definitely is moving from flowery to something else. Yeah. Okay. So okay. we're moving in the right direction. Put it back in. The oven will come back in 30 minutes and see how it looks. We're really just waiting for that percent rise now and make sure that we don't go too far. Here is the bulkomatic chart at the three hour mark. You can see that many of the variables are still to the left side of the chart and a few of them are still outside of the box, which means we need more time before bulk fermentation is done. We let the dough continue to bulk ferment for one additional hour. So this was now four hours from the time we mixed the dough. That's right in the midpoint of the recommended time between three and a half and four and a half hours. The dough temperature remained at exactly 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. The percent rise was 27 and a half percent, which was close to the 30% rise we were shooting for. The dough was domed on top with a nice shoulder around the edges. There were many, many bubbles on the top at this point. There were many bubbles on the side. When we did the wobble test, the dough was continuing to be loose and aerated. The window pane test showed a strong translucent window pane. And now the smell test. Give me your official assessment. You've been pretty good okay. so far. This is the one we're waiting for. 
That smells kind of rich, a little acidic, but in a good way. It smells textured. It has hints of oak and uh, elderberries <laughs> eaten raw. Give me the thing. <laughs> That's the sweet smell. No, no, smell that. That's that's what I call the sweet smell. It's almost as if you yeah. put sugar in your mouth. Yeah. Is that what you smell when you go in there? Yes. That's now it. that you've said that and I've stopped joking. Yes, that is the smell we're done. Now let's look at the chart. That is the sweet smell of success. And we're in the sweet spot of the Balkamatic system. Look at that. I mean, Amazing. everything right down the middle, everything in the zone. That's right where we want to be, right there. Okay. Okay. But I do have one question about yeah, this. Yes, lay it on me. How's come you don't go down to the corner store and just buy a loaf of bread? Okay, now we're ready to start pre-shaping. Now, the reason we have to pre-shape is because this batch of dough is enough to make two large loaves of bread. We're actually going to make three. Wow. So we're going to split this up into three segments. And then we're going to do pre-shaping, which is just taking this massive dough after we cut it up and getting it into some rough rounds. Mm -hmm. Let that sit for a minute. Let the dough relax. Then we'll come back and do final shape, and I'll show you how to do that. Now this dough handling is a little tricky. This is the first time you're doing this. What you want to do here, now you want to be careful when you're taking this dough out of that vessel because every time you touch it now, you're possibly degassing it. That yeast worked so hard to fill it with gas, and if you really manhandle it, you're really mistreating the yeast in a horrible way. Okay, so dump that out carefully onto this surface. Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous dough. Look at that. Look, what did I do? It's gorgeous. Now, sometimes if that I only dough... wish I could have done this well with my kids. <laughs> sometimes if that dough is too far along, you'll see the gluten strands, the stringy gluten really pulling off the backside of the bowl. Yeah, I'm not seeing that at all. So this dough is still a little firm, actually, uh, which is okay. Um, Really nice dough. It's going to be beautiful dough to shape. That's gorgeous looking dough. Okay, I'll take that away from me here. Now what we need to do is divide this. <clears throat> so imagine first if you were going to divide it in half, we're going to make three loaves. A round loaf is called a boule. That's the French word for ball. Yeah, a boule. And then we're going to make two half-sized loaves that are called betards. No, they're called betards or a different shape. And you know what that's French for? A bat. No. Oh, really? It's from the famous boulanger Mickey Mantel from France. And then he played oh. for the Yankees. He made bats and balls. <laughs> ah oui. Or Le was, Mickey Mantel. I'm sorry, it was Michel Mantel. Michel Mantel. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is it, I thought it was bastard. Oh, is Batard. that right? Ah. So Maybe, we're I don't know. a bastard loaf. We're making, making two bastards in one ball. Two bastards in one ball. <clears throat> okay, so first cut it in half. I kind of see a line looking this way. Just and cut eh. down. Oh no. Yeah, this is gonna happen. Oh, okay, hold geez. on for a second. Hold the phone. Pull pull that straight up. On Got the loaf? It. Yep, on the loaf. Okay. And now try to cut that in half. Okay, yeah, that's there you so go. much better. Beautiful. Perfect. Ooh, that dough looks gorgeous. Very satisfying. Look how that's standing up. God. Look at that chasm between the two. I've seen this done. Yeah. With one of these things. And okay. it's so satisfying. Now do one more of those lines this way. I actually, do this one. I like the size of that one a little better. That's going to be our two half loaves. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It takes a oh, 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 gee. God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay, so now we have three. That's going to give you a little bit of practice because this is a little tricky. Okay. Now, pre-shaping, we need to do two things. We still need to build more height. That's how you get the big puffy loaf. So we're, this is our last chance mm -hmm. before we do final shaping. Yep, flip it on its top right over here. Oh, geez, over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on its... So, um, yep, yep. There. Uh, don't do that too hard because you're degassing. You're, you're just... The yeast worked so hard. I didn't know I was working okay. with balloons here. It's like a giant balloon. Now we need height. So this is you're in your at the county fair at the dough stacking contest again. Okay. You get to go around one time, like grabbing and yes. pulling, and see how tall you can stack that dough. And as soon as you get the last piece stacked, you use that knife to flip it back over to hold it in place. Okay, dough stacking contest. Grab a corner, stack it as tall as you can, one time around. 
like that. Beautiful. Thank you. You're you're winning the contest. Keep I am. going. I think you could get a little taller. I I've, is I've, that the tallest you can go? Keep going. One more, maybe on that other side. Over here. Yep. I also have a 500 pound pig. Uh, right hand, <laughs> right hand. Pick up the dough knife. Flip. <laughs> Boom. Beautiful. Okay. That's really nice. Okay. That's, and that's you. standing up beautifully. You want to see height there? That's like two and a half inches off the countertop. Gorgeous. Now, we need to build surface tension and make this into a circle, into a round. So this is where you're gonna take the bench knife in your right hand. This is a little bit of a tricky maneuver. You're gonna kinda of go like this mm -hmm. with the bench knife mm -hmm. as you're twirling the whole loaf to your left. That's why I had you start over here. This is like Yule Brenner and Debna Kerr, Deborah Kerr and the King and I. Shall we dance? You're barely, da, da, you're da, da. barely touching the counter. You just want to turn and turn exactly. Just like Yule Brenner, if he was making this, go for it, Yule. Like that? Yeah, but push push it to the left. You want to like build surface tension? Yeah. You want to get Deborah Kerr over that way. Yeah. Keep push, you want to push the whole thing. Yep. Go, Keep Deborah, going. go! Push the whole thing over. Yeah, a little. A puzzlement. That's gorgeous. Look, Look at that. that. That's, you did a better job than I expected. Thanks. Shows okay. how much you think of me. Now, carefully take that um, ball and just place it over here without doing any damage to and it. And I'm not putting any flour on my hands or no, water or nothing, anything. No. Oh my just God, it's so beautiful. the dough scraper. I don't want to touch it. Yeah. Just move it over. It'll, it'll hold up fine. Move it over there instead of that. Oh, that dough is gorgeous. Okay. Okay, do the same thing with the other small one. We followed the same steps to shape a second small round for a batard and a large round for a boule. Put it over there in the resting area. Beautiful. Now we're going to cover these with a towel so they don't catch a draft. We're going to let them sit for 20 to 30 minutes, let that gluten relax a little bit more, uh -huh. and then we'll do final shaping. Okay. I'll cover those up. It's a very nice towel. Thank you. Okay, the pre-shaped rounds have rested. Now we're ready to do final shaping. So we're going to do the two batards first, then we'll wrap up with the bool. Okay. So you can remove that cover there. Let's, Let's sure. see how this shapes up. Voila. Very nice. Okay. Okay. Take one of those rounds for the um, the batard, one of the small ones. Le batard. And now flip it over on its lid, on its top. Yes, you slam it again. Um, again. Okay. Now, here's how we're going to shape this batard. You yeah. want to stretch this into a bit of a rectangle like this. This. Yep. That, not that. No, that. You want to stretch that into a rectangle like this. Uh huh. And then you want to fold one side like this. One side like this, kind of making a little arrowhead shape. Yeah. Then you're gonna grab it yep. and roll, roll, roll like that. That's the batard. But when you're rolling, you wanna kind of pull on the ends to make sure that you're stretching it back out this way because it's gonna wanna just be a big ball in the middle. Uh huh. I'm gonna do that again. Lefty. We're gonna put it in a rectangle. Rectangle, right? Da, 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 da. Roll, just yeah. roll, roll, yeah. but I'm stretching as I'm rolling. Okay. Voila. All right. Go for it. Oh. With my hands. Yeah. You can wet your hands if you want. We, we don't use flour because you want the dough to stick to itself. When you put flour on the dough or flour on your hands, it's like trying to wrap Christmas presents if you put flour all over your hands. And then you'd be like grabbing scotch tape and the tape wouldn't stick. That's exactly the same reason you don't use flour here is because we're using that like glue. If you knew how many Christmases I've ruined. Yeah. Tom. Yeah. From putting flour on your hands when you're wrapping presents. Exactly. Yes. That dough looks pretty good. Is that big yeah, enough? Good. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, and yep. now we're gonna go yep, but like a little that. Bit pointy on top. Not yep. Oh, I was not yep. as pointy as that's I okay. could have been. Now, grab like this. And yep. Roll, roll, and stretch, and roll st and stretch. Roll. Like that. Yep. Keep going. One more. Eh. Like that. Beautiful. Look at that. That's perfect. Now, see how you got these holes on the ends? Yes. Grab that top flap. This stretch guy. Stretch it. Yep. Stretch and tuck it under. Under. And beautiful. Okay. Beautiful. Yep. Same on the other side. Okay. Then you're going to take your bench knife here. Yeah. And on that side and that side, just do a little tuck, a little tuck, 
try to tighten those sides in. Like oui, that. Oui. Yes, beautiful. We oui. away. Sasse. Beautiful. That's a Sa beautiful, beautifully shaped. Like That's hard. Now we can put flour on it because it's all sealed up. The package is sealed up. Yes. Right? So you can coat the outside of the it's package. It's Christmas Eve. Yep. Coat your packages with flour. Nothing bad's going to happen. It looks like snow. It's very festive. It's very festive. Now I have these little shaping baskets. In France, these would be called bannetons. Those are wicker baskets. I don't use bannetons because I'm cheap. I just made these in my shop. It's basically a loaf pan with this little wooden insert in here. Okay. And it's just going to keep the shape yeah. of the loaf. That so would now, be called a, a bannaton. Bannaton. I, I thought think. that was the clothing store where you shopped in the 80s. Yes. Yes. With blue, red yes. pants. Colors of bannets, bannaton. Um, so now lift that up and you want to flip it top down. You got to be kidding yeah. me. You, you can use the knife. Flip it top down, roll it in there. Ooh, perfect. Look at that. Look at that. Now you do the shake test. It's like Roman meal bread. Um, I don't know what that is. It's oh, that, oh, yes. You yeah. got to. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now <laughs> I just like to see how the dough behaves once it's shaped. So just hold that up under the camera and rock it back and no, the long way. Rock it back and forth, a little more. Rock a pie, baby, on the treetop. It's still a little stiff. Okay, I just like to see how when it shakes. When the wind blows. Good. Put that down. We're gonna cover that up. Moving okay. on. That's hard number two. Same story. You bata. Come over here. And I am not going to slam it this time. Right. Please, no slamming. Eh. Okay. Pretty good. Okay, more, mm, good. All right, now I'm gonna do better this time. Pointy top, wide bottom. At the arrowhead. Yep. yep. We, oui. how I? Rolling, tuck and roll. Et comme ça, et comme ça. Uh oh, it's sticking. Mm. Et, oh, I, okay. I didn't really pull it. It's okay, you can tighten it up with that. Use and that. now I know I'm tightening this. Yes, that side, yep. This side. Yep, then tuck your ends. Uh oh. Oh, God. Tuck your ends in. But you know, with your, uh, remember, pull the flap. Oh, yeah, 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 the flap. Pull the flap. Oh, my God. It gets sticky. It's it's warm. It's bread dough, Tom. I mean, it's still fermenting. Like, we think it, it knows when bulk fermentation is done because we decided it's done. Yeah. That dough is still fermenting like crazy. And we've been here for like 16 hours. About, yeah. But all it knows is the temperature. It just keeps going and going. You got to tighten it up two more times. I one do. side, other side. We, we. Uh oh. Okay. Perfect. That's beautiful. Look at that shape. Dust it up. Panatone? How do you spell it? No, Banaton. B A N N E T O N. Banaton. <laughs> gonna do the banaton here. Yeah, then you're gonna flip that floured side. Uh, yeah, we're down. gonna take that loaf. Yep. We're gonna put it right there in the banaton. Yeah, banaton. There you go. Just like that and that. Beautiful. That's a really nice loaf. Do that shake test again oh, so yeah. you can see how that moves. Rock a bye, Pretty baby. Good. See, that actually looks a little bit looser, that loaf right there. Yes. Okay. Nice. Moving on, number three. Oh, oh, this is the big one. The boule. This is a totally different shaping. Oh, man. Yeah, because you got to learn. You know, I'm trying to teach you something here. So now we're going to do the classic tartine fold. If you read the book and I did. followed the instructions in the book, this is how it would have you make a boule, which is a classic round loaf. Yes. So did you know that boule is French for ball? I did not know that. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Okay. So flip that, <laughs> flip that one over. Right about here, leave yourself a little room because it's going to come towards you the, the way that we do this one. Okay. okay. Oh my God. Right there. Voila. Beautiful. Did now, not slam. Same thing. You want to stretch that into a rectangle. Okay. Uh huh. That's beautiful dough. Look I know that. my shapes. Yep. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Now the tartine fold, this is a little bit different here. So what you're going to do is we're going to make an envelope. Is imagine if you had to make an envelope out of a piece of paper. I okay. You're going to fold the bottom up. Uh huh. You're going to stretch these two sides out. Then you're going to go flop, flop, yeah. like that. Then you're going to grab the top 
and close the package. Okay, I'm gonna so go. First, you're gonna fold the bottom up. Up. Like maybe, maybe not quite halfway. Do I use this thing? Mm, no. Yeah, that, won't, that won't help you too much there. Okay. I'm gonna go, oh God. Oh yeah, no, use the, use the bench knife. It's sticking, it's yeah. Terrible. Yeah, there you go. The, the dough handling is the hardest part. It's almost like it's glue. Yeah. 10. Glue 10. Okay, then stretch those sides out a little bit. Yes. And then flop the left over the center and flop, not the whole side, just the bottom part there, yeah. Like that? No, way over the center. You gotta go way, oh, way over. Yes, okay. exactly. Then and I'm going that one way, out, way over. over. Right. Look at that. Now grab the top yeah. flap and you're gonna pull that, pull, you're not gonna roll it like the last one. You just wanna grab, grab that top and pull it over to seal the package. Oh, beautiful. Ah, now, now you're losing your oh, tension sorry. there. <laughs> now roll the whole thing towards you. So keep the package sealed up and get the top on the top. Oh, beautiful. Oh, come on. And now you do your little twirling thing where you want to tighten that into a ball. You were pretty good little at that. Little Yule Brenner. Your little Yule Brenner move. Maybe a little tighter. That's tight. Okay, wait, that's too tight. Now you're ripping it. Okay. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. You're misshaping Sorry. It. Just tuck that, tuck that under. Fine. Perfect. Okay, that's the bool. Now you're gonna flop, flour that and flop it. Flour and flop. Yep. <laughs> if I ever, never mind. Okay. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> That went in I, upside That was just down. a flop. That went in upside down. Okay, yeah. no problem. Flip the whole thing back out. Jeez. <sighs> you just got a little flour on the outside of the whole thing. It's okay. When you said flour and flop, I took you literally. Yeah, you really flopped that one. Should I shape this again? Yeah, tighten it up again. Okay. That's your top side. So you want that on the bottom. I don't need to flour it again, right? No, it's got plenty of flour on all sides now. Flop it in there. We oh beautiful et voila okay bon. now so these loaves are done with final shaping it's unbelievable now we have three options for how we finish these loaves one we could leave these on the countertop for three to four hours at room temperature and we could bake these today mm -hmm. that gives you a real mild loaf it doesn't really bring out the sour flavor very much right the second option is we're gonna put these in the, you can put these in the refrigerator for what's called an overnight cold retard. Retard means slow down. That is also French. Yes. So, so when we put these in the refrigerator, they're gonna keep fermenting for a while because even though the refrigerator is at 37 degrees Fahrenheit, three degrees Celsius, the dough temperature takes 10 hours to get down to the refrigerator temperature. Almost as long as we've been doing this today. <laughs> Almost. So. It's gonna start at 80 degrees, then it's gonna ferment at 70 degrees, 60 degrees, 50 degrees, and that will keep building the flavor in the refrigerator. So, so the cold retard is recommended. Okay. So that's my preferred way of doing it. Chad Robertson recommends eight to 12 hours in the refrigerator. Unless you wanna get up at two o'clock in the morning, we're probably gonna let these go 16, 18 hours so that we could bake at a reasonable time tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So these are gonna even have more flavor development time. But the third option is, a little bit of a combination of the two. Oh, I got, can I guess? Yes. Okay. The third option is that we go down to the corner store and we buy a loaf of bread. We're so close. How could you possibly do that now? I mean, this is, you almost have three loaves in front of you right now. Okay. Okay. So the third option is these loaves still look a little stiff to me mm -hmm. and I want to make sure they're not underproofed. So I'm just going to make an executive decision here and say, I want to leave these on the countertop for another half hour to make sure they're fully proofed, give them a little more time to aerate before they go in the fridge, they just look a little stiff and, and that we didn't get the 30% rise. Mm -hmm. You know, we had 27.5%. I'm just gonna do, take out a little insurance policy here, give them a little more time to rise here on the counter, then they go in the fridge, then we'll bake them up tomorrow. You good with that? Yeah. Great. And now I'm gonna go down to the corner store and buy a friggin' loaf of bread. See you tomorrow.
It's the morning of day two. It is time to score and bake the loaves. Brother Bob has reluctantly agreed to return and finish the job. Hey, Brother Bob, good morning. Good morning, Tom. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take the loaves out of the refrigerator. They've been in there for 18 hours on something called a cold retard. During that time, they continue to ferment and, and we went for 18 hours, which helps build some real complex, interesting flavor. That's more than the recommended time of eight to 12 hours. So these should be good tasting loaves. So the first thing that we're doing now is I'm preheating the ovens. I have Dutch ovens in the oven. We bake in a Dutch oven because what we're trying to do is get as much heat really close to the loaves as possible. Because when you bake a loaf in a bakery, you'd be baking at 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which is almost 500 degrees Celsius. We can't go up to 900 degrees. They also have steam injectors in bakeries. We can't inject steam. So by using a Dutch oven, you basically create an oven within the oven where you put that radiant heat right on the loaf and it traps the, the, the moisture in the loaf. That's part of the reason we do this high hydration where we really loaded this up with water because now all that steam is going to come out of the bread and then it's going to give you that thick, crisp, crispy crust on the outside. That's how you get the crust. Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> now, the loaves have been in the refrigerator for 18 hours. And we've been of, here for 18 hours. <laughs> and one of the things I mentioned yesterday is that when we ended bulk fermentation, you think that the loaf stops fermenting, but it doesn't. The yeast and lactic acid bacteria, they don't know bulk fermentation is done. So they keep fermenting during your little dance routine of pre-shaping. They keep fermenting during final shaping. And when they go into the refrigerator, they keep fermenting. Take a look at this picture. I'll put it up on the screen. If you put a continuous probe thermometer into one of the loaves, that's what the temperature does. It takes almost it, 10 hours to get down to the refrigerator temperature of 37 degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius. Even after four hours, you're only down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. That's still active fermentation. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So the other thing that happens in the refrigerator that some people don't know is they set the refrigerator, say, to 37 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature will differ on different shelves. So as a experiment, I put one of your batards on the top shelf, which is usually warmer because warm air rises. And I put one of your batards on a middle shelf and because that will typically be colder. And I put a thermometer on each one. Let me grab those out of the refrigerator and see what they look like. Holy mackerel. Let's take a look at these bastards. So here's the top shelf loaf, 45 degrees Fahrenheit on the top shelf. The middle shelf, 37 degrees Fahrenheit. That's seven degrees difference Fahrenheit. And take that cover off. Look at the difference that made in the loaves over 18 hours. So that loaf on the top shelf, see how puffed up that is. You can yeah. see that really kept fermenting Yeah. because the yeast only knows time and temperature. And here we put this one into hibernation. I mean, this yeast went to sleep a while ago. That yeast is still going. So Wake that's, up. That's the difference between the two. I'm going to put this one back in the fridge and we're going to work on the cold loaf first. This bastard right here. Yeah. You can stop saying bastard pretty soon. It's batav. Batav yes. bata is bastard in French. Okay. That's hard. Batav. Batav. Okay. <laughs> now we want to take the, the dough out of these loaves. So these are upside down. If you remember, you flip that upside yes. down. So the top side is down. So we want to put some white rice flour on the bottom. That'll keep it from sticking. So just lightly dust the bottom of that with some white rice flour. The reason we use rice flour is because it's gluten free, oh. which means it's glue free. You don't want to put regular flour on the bottom of your loaf if you're trying to make it not stick because it'll make it stick. Exactly. Because it's glue. Tom. Exactly. Is that enough? Yes. Okay. Fine. Yep. Okay, good. Now, this is a technique that you want to do. You're going to put this diamond shaped parchment paper over the top of that loaf like that. You're going to put your palm right in the middle of it. And then you want to pick up the whole thing from the bottom and flip it over oh so the dough comes out on the parchment paper. The bottom of the pan? Bottom of the pan. Okay. Flip the whole thing over. Flip, you bastard. And then set it down on the countertop. Uh. Good, perfect. Then take the pan off. Take the, the spacer off. Oh. And now carefully, oh very, God. very carefully remove that towel. Here we go. It's the unveiling. 
Oh, that's, now, a, that's a beautiful beauty. loaf. Now see how that's standing up. See how you got that really nice edge on there. It's a really nice looking loaf. You definitely don't want to see the loaf immediately relax yeah. when you take it out of the refrigerator because that implies that it's overproofed. A very stiff loaf implies it's underproofed. This one looks pretty good to me. Okay, now just do a little bit of tucking the corners in to make that a little bit more like football shaped as opposed to a rectangle. Okay. So just do a little tuck under. A little tuck. A little tuck under. Yeah, that's nice. That's good. Okay, next. Now we need to score the loaves. Scoring means we're going to slice through the skin of the loaf. Now, back in medieval times, there used to be one oven in a town, and different bakers would use the same oven. So scoring the loaf was the way that different bakers could kind of trademark or autograph their loaf so mm. you weren't fighting over like, hey, that's my loaf. And you're like, no, that's mine. Right. Because yours would have a different scoring pattern. <clears throat> the second reason we do scoring is because that loaf is going to increase in size by about three times. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to explode wherever the weakest point in the dough is. So we want to tell it where to open up. So the scoring basically pre-cuts it to say, I want this loaf to open up on the top where I decided as opposed to just blowing the side out where it happened to find a weak It's point. like tagging. It's like graffiti. It is a little bit like graffiti. So could I, could I like put like crips or no, red? No, no initials. We're going to keep this real simple. We're going to do a functional scoring as opposed to a decorative or personalized scoring here. Okay. But before we do that, I really like a sesame loaf. So we're going to do one of these loaves with sesame seeds. You like sesame seeds? I love sesame seeds. Okay, spritz the top of that loaf with a little water. Yeah, da, 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 ya, da, more, ya, da. more, keep going more, more. Now, more. Tom, yep. as I understand it, scoring also means that you, you apply music to a movie or... Yes. So when you say scoring, should I score this with like a... Like a ba 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 ba. Yes, that would be a good scoring for the scoring process. Okay, good. Yes, so we'll you do score that. the film. Yes, yeah. and I'll worry about scoring the bread. Okay, we'll coat that with sesame seeds completely. Look at that. Completely. Good. Okay. And then here's a little black sesame, just for a little accent. You don't want to overdo it with that. Just a little bit here, a little bit there. Oh, oh look oh at that. Oh, my God. Oh, it's beautiful. Love it. Good. Okay, good. Now, we don't want all those sesame seeds on the parchment paper to burn up in the oven, so broom those off a little bit. Oh, these? Yep. Uh-huh. And is this a makeup brush? It's actually a paintbrush that I bought at the hardware store. Okay. But I only use it for bread making. All right. Good. Now we're going to score that loaf. Ba, 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 ba. Now this, the name of this in French, this is called a lame. Lame. It's spelled L-A-M-E. That's a lame. That's kind of lame. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> or in French, it would be a lame no, or something like that's that. That's not at all. What okay. It or would it be lame, like a gold lame jacket? If there's an accent over No the accent. Okay, okay, this so is a lame. Right, it's lame. Okay, so be careful with this because it's razor sharp because it's actually a razor blade. That so is. what you want to do is you want to hold it on the rubber part here, and you want to go just to the right of center and just do a little arc down the loaf like this, just like that. Wait, right? Just right of center. And I'm going to go in a curve? A little curve. You're doing a giant curve with your finger there. This is just a little arc. Almost a straight line, but like just an arc. Okay. Just to the right. And you want to go pretty deep. This thing will actually stop you from going maybe too deep. Um, cut it deeper than you think you should. Okay. Oh, my God. And I God. think it'll be good. And you want to go end to end. So I'm going to go no, like... No, no, no. Right from right here to there. Like middle to middle with a small arc. Like this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You gotta, right. Try not to be lame with this and long. Do, do, you got to be confident. You got to do it in one stroke. You don't want to saw your way through. Keep going. Press harder. Keep going. Keep going. Yes. yes. Good job. Go down a little bit further, almost down to the countertop on the end there. Cut that little end right there. Just oh, a oh, little. Oh. little. Eh. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Now set that loaf aside. I'm going to get the other loaf because we need to get these in the oven at exactly the same time. Okay, hurry, hurry, hurry. Time is of the essence, Tom. Clean up your workspace there. With what? With the lalam, the makeup brush, the spritzer? What do I use? Um, the Dutch wand? No, not this. 
Here, I got it, I got it. We got time problems here. Loaf number two, this is the <coughs> Betard's Betard brother. Oh yeah. yes, did I get that right? Bata. You gotta get that at the end. Bata. Okay, first thing we do is light dusting with rice flour to rice keep flour. it from sticking. Oh, the weather outside is frightful. That's enough. Okay, that was a lame scoring of that good. process. Yep. But a good try. Now you do the flip. Okay, I'm gonna flip it. Not flop. No. Very good. Thank we'll you. Move. Now, reveal. Oh, oh look how beauty. puffed up that one is. Look at wow. That. Look at that. Now tuck your corners in a little bit like the shape of a football. Okay. So that one's got a little more air in it. You can tell that one's a little yeah. further along fermentation wise. Now you're going to score this one. You see, did a pretty good job on the other one. Okay. I'd say, uh, see how you kind of cross the center line as you finish that one. You want to stay to the right of center the whole time. You want to start at the center, oh. go to the right of center a little, not much more than you did before, and then end back on the center line uh, again. Keep going faster. Be more confident. Go, go, go. Keep, keep going. Oh, jeez. Uh, we. Oui. Okay, very nice. And you see how that one opened up a little bit more? Yeah. That means it's proofed more. So good. one, of, so this would be a good comparison of different proofing levels on the two loaves. This one is more proofed than that one. This is a more proofed bastard. It is. Okay. With a lame cut. Yeah. Now, I'm going to carefully bring the Dutch ovens out here for you. And you're going to pick those up by the sides of those little lifters yep. and drop them in the Dutch oven. Seated Number loaf. One. Seated loaf. Work quickly. Flying the in. Oven's wide open. Hear Bam. That? Hear that sizzle? Yes. That's hot. 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Perfect. Bam. I didn't hear a sizzle on that one. You want those tight? Okay, now let me just describe how we're baking these for the folks at home. This is exactly by the book. We preheat the oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit with the Dutch ovens in. I put the covers on askew so that you really heat the inside of the Dutch oven. That's 260 degrees Celsius. When we put the loaves in, we immediately reduce the temperature to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 232 degrees Celsius. And then we bake for 20 minutes with the lid on. After 20 minutes, we're gonna take the lid off and then we bake it for another 15 to 20 minutes with the lid off at that same temperature, 450 degrees Fahrenheit, 232 degrees Celsius. You good with that? I'm good. So roughly 35 to 40 minutes for these loaves. Let's do the boule. The boule. Le boule. Or la boule. I don't know. Could be le or la. Now let's score your boule. So take the cover off of that one. This was on the, that middle shelf, the 37 degree Fahrenheit, 3 degrees Celsius shelf. Yeah, that's puffed up a little bit. That looks a little puffier than the Batard on that shelf, but not quite as bulbous as mm -hmm. the warm Batard. So uh, dust that up with a little rice flour. Oh, oh, is that too much? Yeah, mm, yeah, that's okay. We'll brush it off at the end. Good. Now, do the flip, not the flop. The flip, not the flop. <clears throat> this is the one that I flopped on before. With yeah, the flip, right? This one's been flopped around quite a bit. Okay. Get your palm where, yep. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Carefully, very carefully. Oh, look at that. That's a gorgeous shape. That's why we use the shaping baskets or the bannetons in French. French. This is a salad bowl in English. Um, <laughs> because you can see the dough really takes the shape over that 18 hours in the fridge. Yes. Now we are going to score this one with the lamb. Same scoring style here, just that little arc, just right of center in the middle. Do your arc confidently, keep going, keep going, drag it through, yes, keep going all the way to the end. Then we pause for a second, we see how that one's opening up. Pause. That one looks pretty good. Sometimes they'll really open up and relax really quickly. Yeah. That's still a pretty firm loaf. Okay, let's get this into the oven. But the boule.
Okay, now we're going to let those bake for 20 minutes and then we'll take the lids off. But while we wait, I got a note from the producer that somebody from our studio audience has a write-in question and he said he sent it to you on your phone. Oh. Okay. Uh, this is from Carmine Totaglioni. How's come you dumbass mother stew don't just take your sorry stupid asses down to the piece of shit corner store and buy a damn mother loaf of bread? Uh, that's a very good question. The reason is because we're actually making our own loaves of bread, uh, Carmine, but thank you very much for that insightful question. Now our 20 minute timer is just about to go off. So after 20 minutes, we're gonna go over and take the lid off of the Dutch oven and see how the loaves look. Are you ready? No. Let's do it. I'm afraid. Let's go. They're hot. This is the reveal. This okay. is the good part. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. <clears throat> One, two, three. Oh, Medalo. Magnifique. Un, deux, trois. Oh, c'est super. Oh la vache. All of the loaves have finished baking and they are out of the oven. Bob, show us your loaf. He actually went to the store yesterday to buy groceries and he bought this bread. We had these three loaves I ready was, to bake. I just needed, I, you know, I wanted to get something that you could just put peanut butter on. What's wrong with the, you? What's your problem? You know, I wanted to get some Italian bread. Who cares? Manaj, you manaj. Take that loaf out of here. Okay, let's take a look at the loaves of real bread. Number one, this is the Batard number one, the sesame loaf. Take a look at that. That is a gorgeous loaf. It did not quite get as much height as I've seen on some other loaves, but that's a beautiful shaped loaf. Very nice job on your shaping yesterday. Thank you. You had very deft dough handling for a, a novice sourdough baker, I must tell you. Very nice. Thank you. You can see that opened up in the middle, that's called the bloom. And then what we typically look for, you can see here this little ridge or that little dorsal fin, that's called the ear. And you usually want to see a little bit bigger ear than we saw there. So that loaf is a little compact, but a very nice loaf. Now here is that loaf's brother. And let me remind you, the only difference here is that this loaf was on the top shelf in the refrigerator at seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer than that other loaf. Look at this. This is a textbook that's hard. Just spectacular. It's Look at beautiful. the way the bloom opened up so wide on the top. That gigantic ear. Hold that up to the camera so they can see that ear. Look at that. Just spectacular. Come on. And then you got that blistering on the backside here. Turn it around. That blistering is super desirable. A lot of people try to get that. Really beautiful. That's a textbook that's hard in the tartine method. Absolutely fantastic job. That's one of the best looking loaves I've seen come out of this kitchen in a while. Chad Robertson, eat your heart out. <laughs> Very nice. Let's look at the boule. And here we have the boule. Look at this. Another spectacular loaf. Looking at that, I mean, you can just see that gigantic bloom, how much that opened up. This really nice coloring here. You want to see that kind of dark mahogany color on the top. Beautiful blistering, very nice height. I mean, all these loaves have spectacular height, opened up really nicely. Good job. Fantastic loaves. Yes. We're gonna Beautiful. let these cool for 90 minutes and then we'll cut them open and inspect the crumb and see how they look on the inside. I'm gonna do it right now. No, but... no, no. You can never cut into a warm loaf. You have to let them cool because they're still cooking. What about Even... just a little No, bit? no, 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 no. You really, you really have to let it cool. It's still cooking. It'll be really gummy on the inside if you get impatient. So. But we're the gonna, butter we're just gonna, melts on the... Oh, it gets, um, um, we're just going to wait 90 minutes. And then we'll, we'll, just, no, no, no. 90 minutes. No. Okay, he kept his paws off the loaves for 90 minutes. It is finally time to cut the loaves. You get to do the honors. This is one of my favorite knives because it makes a really nice sound coming out of the sheath. Wow.
Okay, Tarantino, that's enough. What? All right, loaf number one. Let's cut this open and see what the crumb looks like. Our batard with the seeds was number one. Straight down the middle, across the ear is how you wanna cut that, right down the middle. Okay. Okay, this is a question I have. Yeah. How come we don't just go down to the corner store? Oh. And, okay. Um, so hold the loaf. Yeah. Put the knife all the way through. Uh, push it. Push it through that way. Yep. Then drag it back while pushing down. Like that. Yep. Yes. Oh. Okay. Now let's see the crumb. Hold it up. Oh, very nice loaf. Very nicely proofed loaf. Super. How's it smell? Mm, it smells great. That's a really nice loaf. That's that irregular open crumb, the mix of small, medium, and large holes. Really nice job. Okay. Loaf number two. Can I do another knife? On no. no. Okay. Loaf number two. Spectacular ear on, on that loaf. Love that one. Here we go. That is some ASMR right there. I don't know what that means. Oh, that, that's a prize winner right there. Gorgeous loaf of bread, perfectly proofed loaf. I mean, look at that. You that's... even got that little swirling pattern in there. See that like circular swirl of the crumb? Yeah. From That's from your expert shaping that you did. Okay. Really beautifully proofed loaf there. That That is a gorgeous loaf. Nice. And the reason they call that little dorsal fin the ear yeah is because if you look at that in profile it looks like a rabbit ear oh look at uh, that once you see it you can't unsee it you can't unsee it it's a little bunny it is a little bunny yeah even got the eye in the right place yeah there. look at that yes there cute beautiful job i want to eat this bunny. no uh, not yet okay, okay. lastly haha <laughs> loaf number three the big bull the bull you like this? Yeah, I always cut across the ear. It looks a little odd, but we're going to do it that way. Okay. Yep. Okay. Let's see it. Do the reveal. Oh, oh. another beauty. Fabulous crumb. Fabulous. Incroyable. Beautiful. Really, really well nice. done. Really nicely done job there. Thank I don't you. have anything negative to say about these loaves, even though I really want to say something negative about your job. No, what? I'm just kidding. What? I'm kidding. You did a spectacular job. Thank you. That's all I can say. Except for the... What? What part? You said you had something negative you wanted to say. No, I'm saying I can't. Fess up, Tom. No, I'm saying I can't even come up with anything. You got a problem with my bread making I'm skills? I'm saying I can't even come up with anything. Well, come up with something. Come on, to. you're clearly oh, not it's telling me. Dense. It's a little dense on oh, top. Oh, it's, it's dense. Like, now it's, it's dense. Like, so you say it's perfect and now it's maybe dense. Maybe you tightened it a little too much. Like maybe you were a little heavy handed on the shaping. Okay, maybe, okay so I got heavy hands. I got ham hands. Is that what you're saying? A little ham hands. Yeah, and a little ham in some other areas as well. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay, all right. This is the moment of truth, the taste test. This will finally answer the question, why we didn't go down the corner store and buy a stinking loaf of bread. I still don't know why we didn't go down the corner store. You're and about to learn, give your, give your loaves a taste. Okay, all right, here we go. I'm gonna try the unseated first. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, oh, that's good. Mmm. Mmm. Yeah. Mmm. Little tangy. Mm-hmm. It's got crunch, but yeah. it's also nice and tender. Yeah. In the middle, chewy. Mm-hmm. Mmm. That's a good piece of bread. That's a nice loaf. Yeah. Mmm. 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 Gets even tangier the more you chew it. Yeah. Wow. 
That's a nice loaf of bread. It's amazing. Like, you can, as you're chewing it, you can feel so much texture. Yeah. You can feel all those tendrils. Yep. You know, of the, the matrix. Yes. And you made the you strands made of gluten. I did. Yes. I did. I made them. And that open crumb lets the dough, the bread aerate as you're chewing it. Because mm. you're not just putting a dense piece in your mouth. Right. All that air is going through those openings and that's enhancing the flavor. Yes. Some people think the open crumb is just for looks. It's not. I mean, it no. impacts how you taste the bread. Right, right, right. How's that right. sesame loaf coming over try here? Try sesame now. Yeah, give me a piece of that. Oh, I got a piece. Okay. Oh, I like that. That's a nice loaf. Yeah. Mmm. Mm. Perfect crust mm -hmm. on all these. Just enough crunch without breaking your dental work. I broke no dental work. That's good. Love that sesame. Yeah, that's good bread. So now, in appreciation for being the very first sourdough apprentice and doing a fabulous job, these are three spectacular loaves. I can't compliment you enough. Thank you. We have a special parting gift for you. I've ordered you your own samurai knife here. Oh! This, this was on sale on Amazon Prime the other day. It says a $14.99 value and I got it on a discount. So that's coming in, in by Amazon today. Oh my gosh. So you're gonna have your own knife to take home. Oh. And I have one other special thing. We're not done with the taste test yet. Okay. I took a little trip down the Satriales down in the corner. Oh! A little provolone, a little gubaga. Hey, the gabagool. The gabagool and a little red pepper. Oh, oh. look at that. Oh. Maro. Load it up. Whoa, look at that gabagool. Mm-hmm. Mm with the provolone. Mm. And the red pep yeah. over here. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. Oh, oh. Mm. Mmm. Mmm. Manna de Miseria. That's good. Mmm. That's a nice sandwich. Mmm. 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 The gabagool. Mmm. 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 Oh, yeah. Mmm. This would be good with pepper and eggs. Oh. Mmm. Mm. 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 Good job, little brother. Good job. Thank you, big brother. You're welcome. This was fun. Thanks for watching. Thank you. If you're still around.